Well, good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome. Thanks for joining me again. Well, I hope you got your Bibles open uh, to that passage in Exodus chapter 15, verse 22, right the way through to 17, verse 7, in a message that I've entitled, When We Grumble. When We Grumble. Before we come to look at it, let us bow before the Lord in prayer. Let's, let's pray. Oh, yes, Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word is truth. That you speak to us, you reveal yourself to us in your word. And, and so how we pray this morning, that you would show us who you are, show us your glory, so that we would be those who truly trust you, no matter what you bring our way. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Well, yes, it's so easy to spot in others. And we don't like it when they do it. Yet we're blind. We don't see it in ourselves. You know, we think grumbling is something other people do. What we do is we make justified complaints or offer constructive criticism. That's what we do. But you know, the reality is we all grumble, don't we? We all do it. We grumble when it's too hot, when it's too cold, when it rains. And that's just about the weather. Maybe you don't grumble about the weather, but you grumble about something. What do you grumble about? Oh, it's so easy to grumble, isn't it? Oh, to find fault, to be discontent or dissatisfied, to be irritated or, and impatient, to moan about the difficulties of life. Now, to you, grumbling may seem like a little thing, you know, a little sin. But God does not, which is made very clear in this section in Exodus, in which we are given three stories of grumbling. Well, we pick up the story in chapter 15, verse 22, where the Lord, through Moses, immediately leads his people from the Red Sea into the desert of Shur. But why does God do that? I mean, why does he lead them straight into the wilderness after he's just destroyed their enemies, the Egyptians, in the Red Sea? Well, in verse, verse 25 to 26 of chapter 15, we're told, There the Lord made a decree and a law for them, and there he tested them. He said, If you listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. Also look at chapter 16 verse 4. God says, In this way I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. You see, behind this desert journey, is a test. God is testing them, using the difficulties that inevitably that desert route will present for their good, to test and refine their faith, while at the same time teaching them that no matter what their circumstances, the only way through the wilderness is to trust and obey Him who loves them and will provide for them. And so the Israelites travel for three days from the Red Sea without finding water. And then on the third day, they find water, but verse 23, it's undrinkable. They call the place Mara, which we're told means bitter. But notice, it's not only the water that is bitter. They are. And so they grumble, verse 24. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, what are we to drink? Now, Remember, the Israelites have just been rescued from Egyptian slavery in the most dramatic way. They've just seen the hand of God parting the Red Sea and defeating the entire Egyptian army. They've just sung, the Lord is my strength in your unfailing love. You will lead your people you have redeemed. But all that was three days ago. Today, they are thirsty and they're grumbling. It's unbelievable, isn't it? But then we think about our own lives. 
Oh, we sing of God's unfading love on a Sunday morning and of all the things that He has done for us and promised us in Jesus. But not long after that, we find ourselves also grumbling, don't, grumbling, don't we? And why? Well, we grumble because we forget. We forget God's grace and all that He has done for us in the past. And we forget all He has promised us in the future. All he has promised to do, to be with us, to never forsake us, and to lead us to the promised land, home, to heaven. And the reason we forget is because all we see is our present pain. And so instead of living by faith in God, we live by sight. All we see is our problems. And we say, Mara. Oh, my life is better. Well, how does God respond? Well, notice in verse 25, God graciously shows Moses a piece of wood which makes the water suitable to drink. And so you see, this story is a promise. There is no reason to grumble. If we trust and obey God, we will find He is the God who heals you, just as He healed the bitter water. He will be and will provide all we need. And we see this not only in him him turning the water from bitter to sweet, but then in leading them, notice, from Mara to Elam. Verse 27, then they came to Elam, a place of rest, healing, plenty and and prosperity, where there were 12 springs, we told, and and 70 palm trees, trees, and they camped near the water. Now, those numbers are not by accident, for there were 12 tribes of Israel and 70 elders. And so, in Elam, God te- Elam testifies to God's absolute provision for his people. I know how to take care of you. You, you got Mara, but I'll lead you to Elam. I'll lead you to Elam. Which is also, which is what Jesus says to us today. He says, you know, if anyone is, is, is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. See, in Jesus we find all we need. And so when your life is bitter at Mara, don't grumble. Don't forget God. There is hope. Because all he provided for us in Jesus shows that he hasn't forgotten you. And he has better things in store for you. Hopefully soon. But ultimately in eternity. So trust him. He will lead you finally and eventually to Elam. I can ask you, do you believe that? Do you really believe that? That he is good, that he's for you, that he is leading you? Sovereign over all things for your good? Sadly, Exodus 16 tells us that Israel did not believe that. Because after a stop in Elam, in chapter 16, verse 1, they begin to travel through the desert of Sin. This is now one month into their journey, and suddenly Egypt looks really good to them. And again they grumble, verse 3. If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. It's a horrendous claim. After all that God had done for them, they're saying they were better off dying as slaves in Egypt, that the Exodus has actually made things worse for them, that they would rather live by sight in Egypt than by faith in God. And notice here how grumbling often distorts the past. Yes, they may have had meat in Egypt, but they were singing a very different tune around those meat pots. In Exodus 2, they were groaning, we're told, and and crying out in their slavery. Yes, like many grumblers today, they, they longed for the good old days. 
But what they forgot was that the good old days were not that good. And also notice how grumbling often exaggerates the present. You have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. See, they think they're about to die. But the truth is, I mean, that's an exaggeration. They're not exactly on the brink of starvation with all the livestock that they still have. So we're not talking about needs here so much as wants, which leads to grumbling. But notice at the heart of it all, grumbling ultimately dishonors God. Because their grumbling, though directed at Moses and Aaron, was ultimately against God. We need to hear that. It was ultimately against God. Verse 6 to 8. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. In the morning you will see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, You will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Do you hear that? You are grumbling against the Lord. You see, though you and I might grumble at our spouse, our kids, our parents, our boss, our workers, the government, what we're really saying to God is, either explicitly or implicitly, that you don't trust Him. You're grumbling against Him. You see, if you believe in God, and that He is in sovereign control of everything and every detail, then you have to accept that all of your grumbling is ultimately against Him. It's saying to God, I know how to run the world A bit better than you do. It's insane, isn't it? But that's what sin does. It causes us all to put ourselves in the center of our world and make life all about us. And we want a life without obstacles, don't we? We want a life that's free of suffering. But not only that, we live in a fallen, broken world. We forget that. And so when we don't get what we want, immediately... And when we want it, and precisely how we want it, we grumble. We grumble. And so, see, grumbling is not a problem with our mouth, but of our hearts. It reveals what's going on in our hearts. It reveals we don't really believe and trust that God is big enough to help and good enough to care. Now I ask you, what would be your response to all this grumbling if you were God? I mean, what would you do? They grumble. But notice God responds with grace. With grace. God's response is manna from heaven for his people. Verse 13. In the evening quail will come so that the people have meat. In verse 14. In the morning dew will leave behind thin flakes like frost. The people call it manna. Which sounds like the Hebrew for what is it? Because that's what they ask when they first see it. The answer to their question is, it's, it's the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. It's a miracle. As God miraculously and generously and faithfully provides for his people. And just as before, manna is a test of their obedience and an invitation to trust God. But now, with the manna, this trust takes a particular form notice. In verse 4 to 6 of chapter 16. The Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day they are to prepare what they bring in. And that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. 
You see, manna requires you to trust that God will provide today and then again tomorrow and then again the day after that. You have to trust God one day at a time. This is why verse 21, the leftover manna melted away, we're told, once everyone had gathered as much as they needed. Now, of course, some people don't listen and gather more than they need and get part of it until morning. See, they trust their efforts, their savings, their provision. They go to bed looking at their pot of manna saved for tomorrow, and that makes them feel all secure. But the next morning, what do they find? That it's full of maggots, and it started to smell. You see, there's no alternative but to trust that God will provide more manna tomorrow, which He faithfully does, just as He's promised. Well, the exception, you'll notice, is the seventh day. The Sabbath is to be a day of rest, so the people are to gather twice as much on the sixth day. On this day, and this day alone, the extra manna will keep for the next day. And so the Sabbath too is a test, you see, a test of their obedience and an invitation to trust God. And again, some don't listen because they don't trust God. Verse 27, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it, but they found none. You see, one of the ways in which we demonstrate our trust in God to provide is our ability to rest. That we rest. Which also means, you see, if we can't rest, if we're always busy with our, with our work or with our, with our family, it's because we're not trusting God. So I ask you, do you trust Him enough to stop and rest? Rest in Him. So here in the desert, you see, God is teaching his people to trust him daily. To give them each day their daily bread. And this is also what Jesus teaches us in Matthew 6. He says, therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Tomorrow is my worry, says Jesus. Which means we don't have to worry about how we will cope tomorrow, or next week, or next month, or next year. We can just take one day at a time and trust God for today. And He will give us grace for today. But understand, God doesn't give us grace today for tomorrow. You will have the grace for tomorrow when tomorrow comes. For his mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. So look to God to provide and tell him that you trust him to give him what you need. And God will be faithful and you will learn what the manna was meant to teach Israel. Look at verse 12. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. You will see that he indeed is Lord. That you can trust him to provide now and forever. But notice, still Israel will not learn. Still they do not trust God. Because again in chapter 17 verse 1, there is no water for the people to drink. And again they grumble. But now they also quarrel. They're openly hostile towards against Moses. Again, they they demand water. Again, they want to return to Egypt. Now, remember in the first two stories, stories, we're told that God tested Israel. But in this story, notice the Israelites test God. For in verse 2 there, Moses replies, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? See, Moses understands what they're doing. Which is why in verse 7, he names the two places there as he does. We're told, because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord amongst us or not? 
Do you see? Do you see why grumbling is no small thing? Not only do we see how toxic grumbling is, how infectious it is, and, and how it grows and spreads to others. But also we see how grumbling hardens our hearts. Grumbling presumes to put God to the test. So that we become the judge and God is in the dock. It questions his goodness. It puts God on trial and finds him guilty. When do you realize that? Do you see that? When you grumble, you are judging God. Is that really what you and I want to be doing? Rather, we need to take the opportunity to trust Him than to test Him. Well, in closing, in John chapter 6, verse 31 to 35, Jesus says, Our forefathers ate the man in the desert. As it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, it's not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So they said, from now on, give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Well, the truth is we all fail the test, don't we? We are all guilty of grumbling. And grumbling is no little sin. Don't underestimate what your grumbling is saying to God. But Jesus says the sign that God is real, the sign that he cares for you, that he forgives and wants a relationship with you, is the true bread of heaven. It's him. Which means for you and I, the call to trust God is the call to trust his son, Jesus. The one who was tested in every way, like Adam and Eve, like Israel, but did not fail. He did not grumble. You know, Isaiah 53 verse 7 says, He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. See, this is the hope of the gospel. On that cross, Jesus refused to grumble so that in him there is forgiveness for your and my grumbling. We have no reason to grumble. And every reason to be thankful. Especially because we do not deserve that and all that he has done for us. Such amazing grace. Now knowing that, knowing what he's done for you on that cross, do you trust that God who has given us his one and only son will provide for you today? No matter what. Tomorrow, no matter what. To all, to all eternity? Of course you can trust Him. There is no greater good He could ever give you and me. And if He has done all that already, you can trust Him to work for your good in all things. So resolve in your heart to trust Him. To know what He is doing in the big things and the small. He knows what he is doing. And he is testing you. He's refining your faith. So don't grumble. Look instead to the cross. He has provided. And he will provide. Do you believe that? And all God's people say, Amen. Let's pray. The truth is, you and I have no idea how much we are blessed. And how blessed we are. And 
and yet we always grumble. Our Heavenly Father, the truth is, if our hearts are ever going to be freed from grumbling and ruled by gratitude and thankfulness, we need your grace. We need your grace to remember. We need grace to see. We need grace that produces a heart of humble joy in you. And so as we come around your table, won't you do that? Won't you help us to remember and see your amazing grace and fill our hearts with joy? In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Well, yes, friends, the truth is we have no reason to grumble. We have so much to be thankful for. And so we come now to celebrate that. And so as we celebrate the Lord's Supper together. And the Lord's Supper is a remembrance meal. A reminder that Jesus died for our sins on that cross. A reminder of the wonderful promise we have in Him. And that He is all we need. It's also a thankful meal. Rejoice, celebrate with gratitude for what God has done for us. It's also a meal looking forward as we proclaim Jesus' death until he returns. And it's also a family meal for God's family. For us, it means all who know and love the Lord Jesus, who are trusting in God's promise in Jesus, are invited to come and, and eat and drink. See, in this meal we remember the gospel. Remember the gospel together. Remember with thanksgiving how on the night Jesus was betrayed, he was celebrating the Passover meal. At that meal, Jesus took the bread and ex explained how the next day his body would be broken on that cross, that he would be stand in our place and that he would take the punishment our sin deserves. All our sin, including our grumbling, so that we could be forgiven. He also took the cup and explained how his blood would be poured out as a new covenant for the for the forgiveness of sins. A new relationship with God. And so we come to the Lord's table. And as we do, it's necessary that we do examine our lives. That we repent of our sins. That we are trusting in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ alone for our forgiveness. And as we do, we reflect upon God's word. And, and we acknowledge the truth is you and I have grumbled. I've been so convicted about that this past week in my own life. Without realizing it, I've grumbled against God. And so have you. We have judged God, His plans. And we have, we have lived as though we needed something else, something more than Him. And so come, let's confess our sins to God in silent prayer. Let us, let us bow before Him in prayer. Let's confess our sins to God. Oh, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, of your infinite mercy, you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ. To suffer death upon that cross for our redemption. Who made thereby his one offering of himself never to be repeated a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Oh, thank you, Father, that through the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, you have promised forgiveness of sins to all who truly repent and firmly trust in him. And, and so we come to your table not trusting in our, own, in our own goodness. We have none, but in, in your abundant and great mercy, we come as those who are forgiven. How oh, we know we deserve your judgment. We know we deserve death. But we are so grateful that Jesus served us 
by dying for our sin on that cross. That he set his glory and splendor aside. That he stepped down from his throne in heaven. The bread of heaven. And he entered into our world of pain and, and suffering and sin. And the sinless one became sin for us. Our oh, Father, we praise and we thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. And so, friends, taking this bread and grape juice is a visual reminder that Christ is all we need. That he satisfies our greatest needs. And that he gives us life. And so as we take up the bread, we're reminded, we remember the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember that, that the body of the Lord Jesus Christ was broken and given for you. Eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you. And be thankful. And as we take up the grape juice, remember the blood, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ that was shed for you and for me. Drink this in remembrance that Christ died for you. And be thankful. Let us bow in prayer. Oh yes, Heavenly Father, we thank you because you gave your only Son to die for us on that cross for our redemption. Now, we thank you that by his death he has offered there the one perfect sacrifice for all that was needed to take away the sins of the world and to reconcile us to you. By rising to life, He has restored us to eternal life and has given us Your promised Holy Spirit, the guarantee of our inheritance. And so, Father, we pray, give us such a sense of Your grace that our hearts may be truly thankful. And that we show forth Your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by wholeheartedly trusting You. By walking in obedience to Your call giving ourselves to your service and walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days as we wait for your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, to return. And now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him and so that you may overflow with hope and thanksgiving by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name alone we ask this. Amen.